Oh. 
Metropolitan Museum of New York. At Giza, however, all such visible things have been swept away by time and pillage, and only the rock hewn shafts, either sand filled or cleared out by archaeologists, remain to attest their former existence. offered food and prayers to the offering car or vital principle of the deceased. The small tombs have their chapels contained in their stone mastavas or superstructures, but the mortuary chapels of the pyramid, where regal pharaohs lay, were separate temples. Each to the of its corresponding pyramid and connected by a causeway to a massive gate, chapel, or propylon at the edge of the rock plateau. The gate chapel lead to the second pyramid, nearly buried in the drifting sands, yawn subterraneously southeast of the Sphinx. Persistent tradition dubs it the Temple of the Sphinx. Rightly called such, if the Sphinx indeed represent the second pyramid's builder, Kefren. There are unpleasant tales of the Sphinx before Kefren, but whatever its elder features were, the monarch replaced them with his own, that men might look at the Colossus without fear. in the great gateway temple than the life-size diorite statue of Kefren now in the Cairo Museum was found. A statue before which I stood in awe when I beheld it. Whether the whole edifice is now excavated, I am not certain. But in 1910, most of it was below ground. Entrance heavily barred at night. Germans were in charge of the work, and the war or other things may have stopped them. I would give much in view of my experience and of certain Bedouin whispers discredited or unknown in Cairo to know what has developed in connection with a certain well in a traverse gallery where statues of the pharaoh were found in curious juxtaposition to the statues of Babu. The road as we traversed it on our camels that morning curved sharply past the wooden police quarters, post office, drugstore, and shops on the left, and plunged south and east in a complete bend that scaled the rock plateau and brought us face to face with the desert under the lee of the Great Pyramid. Past the Cyclopean masonry we rode, rounding the eastern face and looking down ahead into a valley of minor pyramids, beyond which the eternal Nile glistened to the east, and the eternal desert shimmered to the west. Very close loomed the three major pyramids, the greatest devoid of outer casing, and showing its bulk of great stones, but the others retaining here and there the neatly fitted coverings which had made them smooth and finished in their day. Presently we descended toward the Sphinx and sat beneath the spell of those terrible unseeing eyes. On the vast stone breast, we faintly discerned the emblem of Rea Racte, for whose image the Sphinx was mistaken in the late dynasty. And though sand covered the tablets between the great paws, we were called with the Moses, the fourth, and 
suffocating crawl through Cheon's mightiest memorial. As we dismissed and overpaid our local bodyguard and drove back to Cairo with Al Abdul Rice under the afternoon sun, we have regretted the omission we had made. Such fascinating things were whispered about lower pyramid passages not in the guidebooks, passages whose entrances had been hastily blocked up and concealed by certain uncommunicative archaeologists who had found and begun to explore them. Of course, this whispering was largely baseless on the face of it, but it was curious to reflect how persistently visitors were forbidden to enter the pyramids at night, or to visit the lowest burrows and crypt of the Great Pyramid. Perhaps, in the latter case, it was a psychological effect which was feared, the effect on the visitor of feeling himself huddled down beneath a gigantic world of solid masonry, joined to the life is known by the merest tube in which, in which he may only crawl, and which any accident or evil design might block. The whole subject seemed so weird and alluring that we resolved to pay the pyramid plateau another visit at the earliest possible opportunity. For me, this opportunity much earlier than I expected. That evening, the members of our party, feeling somewhat tired after the strenuous program of the day, I went alone with Abdul for a walk through the picturesque Arab quarter. Though I had seen it by day, I wished to study the alleys and bazaars in the dusk, when rich shadows and mellow gleams of light add to their glamour and fantastic illusion. The native crowds were thinning, but were still noisy and numerous. When we came upon a knot of reveling Bedouins in the Sukhen Nazi, or Bazaar of the Coppersmiths, their apparent leader, an insolent youth with a heavy feature and saucily cocked tarbush, took some notice of us evidently recognized with no great friendliness my competent but admittedly supercilious host and sneeringly disposed guide. Perhaps I thought he resented that odd reproduction of the Sphinx's half smile, which I had offered, that I had often remarked with amused irritation, or perhaps he did not like the hollow and sepulchral of Abdul's voice. At any rate, the exchange of ancestrally opprobrious language became very brisk, and before long, Alizis, as I heard the stranger called, when called by no worse name, began to pull violently at Abdul's robe, an action quickly reciprocated and leading to a spirited scuffle in which both combatants lost their sacredly cherished headgear and would have reached an even direr condition had I not intervened and separated them. My interference, at first seemingly unwelcome on both sides, succeeded at last in effecting a truce. Sullenly, each belligerent composed his wrath and his attire, and with an assumption of dignity as profound as it was sudden, the two formed a curious pact of honor, which I soon learned is a custom of great antiquity in Cairo, a pact for the settlement of their difference by means of a nocturnal fist fight atop the great pyramid long after the departure of the last moonlight sightseer each duelist
next was to assemble a party of seconds, and the affair was to begin at midnight, proceeding by rounds in the most civilized possible fashion. In all this planning, there was much which excited my interest. The fight itself promised to be unique and spectacular, while the thought of the sea on that hoary pile overlooking the antediluvian plateau of Giza, under the wane of the pallid small hours, appealed to every fiber of imagination in me. A request found Abdul exceedingly willing to admit me to his party in seconds, so that all the rest of the early evening I accompanied him to various dens in the most lawless regions of the town, mostly northeast of the Esbekia, where he gathered one by one a select and formidable band of congenial cutthroats as a pugilistic background. Shortly after nine, our party mounted on donkeys, bearing such a royal or tourist reminiscent names as Ramses, Mark Twain, J.P. Morgan, and Minaha. Mini Minaha. <laughs> Edged through the street labyrinths, both oriental and occidental, crossed the muddy and massed forest at Nile by the bridge of the bronze lions, and cantered philosophically between the Lebecks to the road, on the road to Giza. Slightly over two hours were consumed by the trip, toward the end of which we passed the last of the returning tourists, saluted the last inbound trolley car, and were alone with the night and the past and the spectral moon. Then we saw the vast pyramids at the end of the avenue. Sorry. 
volcanic desert will clear down upon a battle which, for the quality of the ringside cries, might well have occurred in some minor athletic club in America. As I watched it, I felt that some of our less desirable institutions were not lacking, for every blow faint and events bespoke stalling to my not inexperienced eye. It was quickly over, and despite my misgivings as to methods, I felt a sort of proprietary pride when Abdulris was adjudged the winner. Reconciliation was phenomenally rapid, and amidst the singing, fraternizing, and drinking which followed, I found it difficult to realize that a quarrel had ever occurred. Oddly enough, I myself seemed to be more of a center of notice than the antagonists, and from my smattering of Arabic, I judged that they were discussing my professional performances and escapes from every sort of manacle and confinement in a manner which indicated not only a surprising knowledge of me, but a distinct hostility and skepticism concerning my feats of escape. It gradually dawned on me that the elder magic of Egypt did not depart without leaving traces, and that fragments of strange secret lore have survived surreptitiously amongst the Felaim to such an extent that the prowess of a strange howie or magician is resented and disputed. I thought of how much my hollow-voiced guide Abdul Reis looked like an old Egyptian priest or a pharaoh or a smiling sphinx wondered. Suddenly, something happened, which in a flash proved the correctness of my reflections, and made me curse the denseness whereby I had accepted this night's event, as other than the empty and malicious frame-up they now showed themselves to be, without warning and doubtless in answer to some subtle sign from Abdul. Beyond a walk, yet kept me aloft a 
surprisingly short time. It is this perplexing brevity which makes me feel almost like shuddering whenever I think of Giza and its plateau. For one, it's oppressed by hints of the closeness to everyday tourist routes of what existed then and must still exist now. The evil abnormality I speak of did not become manifest at first, setting me down on a surface which I recognized as sand rather than rock. My captors passed a rope around my chest and dragged me a few feet to a ragged opening in the ground into which they presently lowered me with much rough handling. For apparent eons, I bumped against the stony irregular sides, which I took to be one of the numerous burial shafts of the plateau until the prodigious, almost incredible depth of it robbed me of all basis of conjecture. The horror of the experience deepened with every dragging second any descent through the sheer solid rock could be so vast without reaching the core of the planet itself, or that any rope made by man could be so long as to dangle me in these unholy and seemingly fathomless profundity of nether earth, or beliefs of such grotesqueness that it was easier to doubt my agitated senses than them. Even now I am certain, for I know how deceitful the sense of time becomes when one or more of the usual perceptions or conditions of life is removed or distorted. But I am quite sure that I preserved a logical consciousness that far, that at least I did not add any full-grown phantom of imagination to a picture hideous enough in its reality, and inexplicable by a type of cerebral illusion, vastly short of actual hallucination. All of this was not the cause of my first bit of fainting. The shocking ordeal was cumulative, and the beginning of the later terrors was a very perceptible increase my rate of descent. They were paying out that infinitely long rope very swiftly now, and I scraped cruelly against the rough and constricted sides of the shaft as I shot madly downward. My clothing was in tatters, and I felt a trickle of blood all over, even above the mounting and excruciating pain. My nostrils too were assailed by a scarcely definable menace. A creeping odor of damp and staleness, curiously unlike anything I had ever smelled before, and having faint overtones of spice and incense that lent an element of mockery. Then, the mental cataclysm was horrible, hideous, beyond all articulate description, because it was all of the soul, with nothing of detail to describe. It was the ecstasy of nightmare and the summation of the fiendish. The suddenness of it was apocalyptic and demonic. One moment I was plunging agonizingly down the narrow well of million-toothed torture, yet the next moment I was soaring on bat wings in the gulfs of hell, swinging free and swoopingly through illimitable miles of boundless, musty space, rising dizzily to measureless pinnacles of chilling vacua. God for the mercy that shut out in oblivion those clawing furies of consciousness, which have unhinged my faculties and tore harpy-like in my spirit. That one respite 
see. 
mummify it with desperate care and preserve all the vital organs in canopic jars near the corpse. Whilst beside the body, they believed in two other elements, the soul, which after its weighing and approval by Osiris, dwelt in the land of the blessed, and the obscure of these of Kevin. 
touched nothing else in my life, save one thing, which came after in parallel, and that life has been full of adventures beyond most men. Remember that I had lost consciousness while buried beneath a cascade of falling rope whose immensity reveals the cataclysmic depths of my present position. Now, as perception returned, I felt the entire weight gone and realized upon rolling over that although I was still tied, gagged, and blindfolded, some agency had removed completely the suffocating hempen landslide which had overwhelmed me. The significance of this condition, of course, came to me only gradually. But even so, I think it would have been brought unconscious again, had I not by this time reached such a state of emotional exhaustion that no new horror could make a difference. I was alone, but with what? Before I could torture myself with any new reflections, or make any fresh efforts to escape from my bonds, an additional circumstance became manifest. Pains not formally felt were racking my arms and legs, and I seemed coated with a profusion of dried blood beyond anything my former cuts and abrasions could furnish. My chest, too, seemed pierced by a hundred wounds, as those a malign titanic ibis had pecked at it. Assuredly, the agency which had removed the rope was a hostile one, and had begun to wreak terrible injuries upon me, when somehow impelled to desist. Yet, at the time, my sensations were distinctly the reverse of what one might expect. Instead of sinking into a bottomless pit of despair, I was stirred to a new courage and action. For now, I felt forces were physical things, which a fearless man might encounter on an even basis. On the strength of this thought, I tugged again at my bonds, and used all the art of a lifetime to free myself. As I had so often amidst the glare of lights and the applause of vast crowds, the familiar details my escaping process commenced to engulf me, and now that the long rope was gone, I have regained my belief, and that the supreme horrors were hallucinations after all, and that there had never been any terrible shaft, measureless abyss, or interminable rope, was I after all in the gateway temple of Catherine Bahasaid the Sphinx. straining 
lapses whose concession reminds me of the time of nothing more than the crude melodramas of that period. Of course, it is possible that the repeated lapses never occurred, and that all the features of that underground nightmare were merely the dreams of one long coma, which began with the shock of my descent. Should move in such perfect rhythm. <laughs> 
Like that.